Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted an epic life and greater freedom, then do we have the Now or Never show for you. Today I'll be talking with Preston Smiles and Alexi Panos, personal development authors including Love Louder and 50 Ways to Yay, social media superstars, and the authors of an empowering new read, Now or Never, Your Epic Life in Five Steps. And that's just what we'll be talking about today, about the bridge from where you are to where you want to be. That plus we'll talk about mutant wolf zombies and comfort zones, freezing at <laughs> Joshua's tree, Leroy the raccoon, epic and the naked truth, complaints at Burning Man, and what in the world an obsession with Samoyed dogs has to do with anything. Gotcha. <laughs> so good. Someone did their research. <laughs> She's totally obsessed. Too. It's so good. Oh. Uh, awesome. Well, we'll have to dive in there. So welcome to the show, Alexi and Preston. Are you both ready to shine? Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and a mighty woohoo. Oh. So, so before we dive right into things, I want to go back into both of your paths for a little bit. First off, I'd like to start in a little town that I rode my bicycle through on the way across the country many, many years ago, Erie, Pennsylvania. Yeah, you've seen it. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> amazing. Yes, Erie, PA was an amazing place to grow up. Not so awesome as as far as opportunities go mm -hmm. when I became an adult. <laughs> so what was what was childhood like for you? And then how did you end up going from Erie to a career in modeling? Yeah, well, actually, modeling started in Erie, Pennsylvania. Kind so, of figured. Um, Growing up in Erie was fantastic. You know, I, I came from a very Greek family, so we used to have dinners every night together with extended cousins and grandparents, and um, it was great. It was a lot of playing outside, a lot of getting into trouble in the woods and getting really dirty, and I love that. I love that I got to grow up with that as kind of my foundation, mm -hmm. and it really supported me in a lot of the stuff I do now because it reminds me that the roots of everything are, are nature, and the root of everything is really simple, and I love that I had that um, groundedness to grow up with. Now, I got into modeling because my mom, actually, before she had my sister and I, was a model mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. And uh, when she moved to Erie, when she married my dad, she started a modeling agency and she worked in all the major areas. So Cleveland, Buffalo, Pittsburgh and Canada. And she hired like she had real people talent yeah. for banks and for catalogs and for all of the commercials that you would see in the tri-state area. And my sister and I, since we were little, were doing like Disney pamphlets and TJ Maxx ads and all <laughs> sorts of things as like little babies. And then um, I think I hit about seven or eight years old and I was done feeling like getting my hair done. I was a real tomboy. So I was not into that from seven to 12. I was like, don't touch me. Don't put makeup on my face. I want to be a dirty kid. And <laughs> I lived out that dream very well. Yeah. And then around 12, I shot up to um, five, nine, super skinny at the time, super awkward. But New York City agencies love that, right? Oh, They're like, yeah. oh, you look super awkward and super tall and thin. Let's bring you out to New York City and hit the major market. So I started doing my summers and holidays out there and um, did really well, did really well. And that eventually turned into a music career at 15 where I entered an ad on a dare for a singing group, a girl singing group, and ended up getting a solo recording contract. Wow. And that led me to South Jersey where I lived there for a little bit and worked with a recording uh, producer by the name of Rodney Jerkins, who worked with like Brandy and Monica, Michael Jackson, Whitney mm -hmm. Houston. He was like a superstar kid, 20 years old. And that eventually got me signed to MI2, which was a label under Def Jam and Murder, yep. Inc. And I traveled on the road with them from 17 to 19. And that brought me to New York City. So, Whew. <laughs> Bit of a whirlwind. I gave you the abridged version. I, I appreciate it. And, and we may come back around to it because we haven't talked about television yet. But let's, let's go with yes. Preston. Preston, I have less background in you except, except that you used to be a bad boy and you maybe did some things you weren't so proud of back then. <laughs> and, and that, and, and, I, and I, I got this, this misfortune. I, I managed to get my way back out of it, but I was definitely put there for a little while myself into the slow class. 
Yeah, 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 for sure, man. <laughs> I'm I'm super grateful that that happened the way that it did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I grew up in Harbor City, California. Okay. Um, I was born in Compton, and my parents made a decision that they wanted to move to greener pastures, so they moved to this little Dennis the Menace neighborhood called Harbor City, um, which was in the South Bay of Los Angeles. And um, I'm I know I look, you know young and sexy, but I'm 36 <laughs> years young, so I'm closer to 40 than I am to 30. And um, at that time, um, gangster rap, it went from conscious rap to gangster rap. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, the reporting of crime and showing young black males as, you know, heathens and beast and, you know, people to be afraid of uh, was really high. And so, um, you know, and you mentioned this when I was nine years old, I was taken out of um, regular classes and placed in special education classes. And, you know, I'll never forget that day because, you know, I walked into a class with four mentally ill children. And, you know, we're always making decisions and always making choices about ourselves because we are story beings. We build with our language. We're linguistic beings. And so, um, I made a story up that I was the stupid kid, that I was slow, that if those kids were slobbering on themselves and playing with blocks at nine years old, then I must be just as, quote unquote, dumb as them. And so in this search for approval and security, um, I began to become like a, a Robin Hood and huh. I would... I would beat up the the bullies, whoever, whatever bully was bullying the nerds, yeah. I would beat that bully up. I would mess with him until he stopped. And so the nerds, nerds, I'm doing quotes here, would, um, you know, support me. And um, I, I got to put this in. You became the nerd, nerd hero. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and um, by the time I was 11, I was smoking weed and mm -hmm. I joined a gang called NFCG, which stood for Notorious Effing Criminal Gang. I won't say the curse word, um, but uh, and, and, and we bleeping appreciate that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> by the time I was 15, I was towing the line between uh, urban terrorist and an angel. You know, at home when I was in 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 my home, mm -hmm. my mother, my father, my stepmother, my stepfather, all of them thought that I was the greatest kid on the planet. Um, but the moment I walked outside, I was spray painting, fighting, beating people up, um, and just really going through, you know, a rites of passage that isn't presented to, you know, Western kids. Mm -hmm. And so I, I looked for and did what everyone else was doing. And at 15, one of my friends asked me to come out and hang in this blue Astro van that my friend Rudy drove. And it was my first understanding of intuition. And I said no. And an hour later, everybody in that van was shot. And that particular friend, Scott, who was my best friend, was shot in the head and died. And that was a interesting transition because at 15 years old, I didn't know how to process that. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people don't know how to process it now, let alone at 15. And I got scared enough that I asked my dad, could I move? And we, he ended up sending me to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wow. Um, and I got off a plane, and there was a sign with my name on it, and I moved in with this woman, Shirley Russell, and she became my new mom. And she just happened to live in within the, the, the lines of North Allegheny. Mm -hmm. And so I went to North Allegheny High School, which was one of the richest public schools in the nation. And I literally was like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I was the only <laughs> if black. If you didn't kid. bring it up, I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I was the only black kid in, uh, uh, you know, male in the entire school, and I was like the coolest thing since sliced bread. Lucky Everybody dog. Everybody was hanging out with me. Everybody was like, "We got a black guy," you know. And they were all, <laughs> all pumped about it. And um, what I discovered there changed my life forever. Um, within a few weeks, I noticed that my grades. And my behavior changed. You know, at the other school, I would curse, spit on the ground. Mm -hmm. I, you know, treated things, you know, in a particular way. But at this school where you could eat off the ground, I wouldn't dare do those things. And um, interestingly enough, I joined another gang or clique called Wexford Mafia. And uh, this particular night, we were headed to a party with this kid, Brad, and his BMW. And they were smoking weed and drinking, which kids never do that, um, especially while you're driving. Um, and... Uh, listening to Tupac, Outkast, and Biggie. 
And I had this realization that the kids at my former school were doing the exact same thing, Mm -hmm. but getting two different results based on the environment and the expectation. And so I stumbled upon environmental psychology and had this realization that underneath all of our stories, whether it be gay, straight, white, black, Christian, Muslim, you know, Jersey, New Yorker, whatever it is, that the truth of our being is that love is all there is, was, and ever will be. And that set me on this ridiculous path where I went to college, graduated with straight A's with my master's degree, came to LA, got really sick, became an angry vegan, came out of that, <laughs> learned that love is the only way that people can really take in information. And it's more about my me being the embodiment of it. Mm-hmm. And the rest is history. Uh, okay. The most important question I got to ask out of this is angry vegan. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, so, I want to know how you guys met for one thing. Before we do that, though, this sounds like I've, I've just got to go there. Where did faith, if anywhere, fit into the picture? Because how, I can't see how you could not see that something divine was taking place that sure. when you say, I've got to get out, all of a sudden, bling, let's put you someplace where you can really shine. Yes, for sure. For me, um, and it's still to this day, I know I'm being used. I know I'm a vessel for something bigger than myself. And I didn't know how to place why my friends all got shot and I didn't. I didn't know how to hold that something innate, something deep within me said, don't go. And so, and that's been happening my whole life. How, an, how Alexi and I met was a very similar story where something in me said, you have to go. And I was on a date with someone else that I didn't want to go on the date with. Mm -hmm. I went on the date anyway, and next to my date was Alexi. And instantaneously, straight up, like out of a movie, I had that moment where I was like, that's my wife. And so for me, I for sure, faith is gigantic. And I'm, I'm sure Alexi will answer that for herself as well. Yeah, yeah. Faith has been an interesting journey for me because I think I started off being an angry atheist. <laughs> <laughs> both, of, both of my parents, um, my mom was more spiritual. Mm-hmm. My dad, my parents are split. My dad is more of the scientific type, very rational, um, needs proof, needs concrete evidence. And both of my parents are brilliant. And my dad always taught me to question everything and to especially question the things that most of society is taking blind faith in. And so through our conversations at the dinner table, which are very philosophical, which Preston has now been a part of, um, they're like four hour long conversations about philosophy and politics and all all sorts of good stuff. Um, I really had this other perception of faith Mm -hmm. because those who were believers in, let's say, Christianity or any faith, it was mostly Christianity and Erie. um, I felt kind of this animosity towards people who weren't involved in the faith. And that kept showing up for me. One of my best friends was kind of a born again Christian. Mm -hmm. She wasn't when I met her, but came into that. And she pushed me really far out of it where she was like, you know, you're going to hell if you don't believe in this. And I just, I really didn't resonate with faith in that way. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting is through the scientific study of the self and through this deep dive into my own human potential, I've come back full circle to faith because I've come back to this, um, unknown variable, which cannot be answered by science. And what's really cool about it is I've come to faith on my own terms in a completely different way, but that in a way that's so unified in every great major religion, it's the unifying thread through all of it. And I believe that I found that through my scientific mind wanting proof and wanting evidence has come to this deep faith in the unknown magic of this whole thing of creation. Very, very cool. And then would you corroborate the story of how you met Preston as well? Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting is that was a whole bunch of intuition and faith as well, because I was in New York City, it started there, and I was meditating and got this huge yes to move to LA. And as a New Yorker, LA is like off limits. You know, New York and LA kind of have this thing. And (laughs) I, I literally kind of, came out of the meditation and was like, LA, why would I need to move to LA? And uh, there was no concrete reason why. Mm -hmm. Like I set up my life in New York City. I had, you know, high six figure income. I just bought a place that I totally remodeled. 
why the hell would I move? And sure enough, I, I took, I took that as a sign and I booked a trip to LA the next weekend, went out to LA, kind of just explored. I had two friends from New York who had made the move. So I hung out with them and that weekend I decided, and I came back to New York, packed up my books because I love my books and my clothes and that's it. And came on out to LA with no plan. And that led me to eventually dating a guy who I was out in London with, (laughs) <laughs> Preston's given a big thumbs down here. Exactly. For those of you who can't see, Preston disapproves. Um, no, he's but great. It's he's perfect great. because I, I needed to date this guy and go on this trip to London, which I did not want to go on but because it was my first weekend off. And this guy was like, please come out. We never get to see each other. We're always both traveling for work. He's like, I'm having a boys weekend. He ends up missing his flight from Atlanta. So I end up spending the whole first day with these two guys, one of which was Preston's college friend, who after spending all Friday with me is like, you are the female version of this guy, Preston, and you guys have to meet. You're gonna work together, you're doing similar things. Let me put you guys in a Facebook message. So he puts us in this message, Preston responds, I think I maybe respond back, and then that was it. We just kind of let it be. And Preston was under the assumption I lived in London. London. So when we ran into each other at this event two weeks later, he was like, wait, don't you live in London? I was like, oh, no, I live here. And he's like, what? You live here? And then (laughs) long story short, we ended up meeting up for coffee a week later. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a work meeting. He thought it was a date. Um, It turned into a date, essentially. It turned into like a four hour. Good good job, Preston. I know this one. (laughs) Yeah. And it was so great because um, really what turned it into a date for me was I was asking him about his vision. And in terms of I'm thinking I'm going to work with this guy, right? Because mm-hmm. that was the context that was set up for me. And I asked him about his vision and he's telling me about it. and He's super passionate about it. And he's literally describing my exact vision. And it was like one of those click moments where my intuition was like, this is your guy. And it was so crazy because... <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't looking for it i wasn't yeah. looking for it at all but it was so apparent it was so obvious and um yeah and the rest is history from that yep very very cool well you say you weren't looking whenever i hear somebody saying they weren't looking what what the the question that comes to mind is but were you doing the work yeah always see and that's and that's... that's such a great question <laughs> go for <laughs> because it because see people say like oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm not looking, I'm not doing it, but they're not doing anything, mm-hmm. right? They're not doing anything. And I'm super intentional with how I live my life. So I'm always in the work and I've been in the work as a self-practice for the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. So meeting him, it was a perfect culmination of like, of course, it was like right on time because I was ready, but I wasn't looking for it, but I was ready, totally ready. That makes sense. So we're going to dive into your book here. It's a really fun read, and there, there are five key steps or themes through this. And the first step really um, speaks to the stories and the threads that you just both wove together, which is you always have a choice. You both individually made some very key choices that meant everything. Oh, yes. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the first step in Now or Never, our new book, uh, is – really it had to be the first step because it's without awareness there is no choice Mm -hmm. and one of the things we speak about in our workshops and what we teach all the time is you can't intervene in a world you truly cannot see Mm -hmm. and most people are blind to themselves so um, making sure that you know we really unearth what's actually operating us which is why one of the first things we, uh, we we put in the book is conscious and unconscious agreements because most people have unconscious agreements that have been running their lives for years. What's, and we what's know an example? That. So an example of an unconscious agreement would be, um, um, here's a good one. The, the female that is looking for the one, right? And she's doing all the right things, mm-hmm. but nothing's happening. She might have an unconscious agreement that all men are dogs. Men are not to be trusted. Relationships don't work out. Commitment isn't real, monogamy doesn't work in today's world. All of those are unconscious agreements that are the filter with which she's acting out her perfect actions. The the pistol she's shooting herself in the foot with. 
Yes, totally. exactly. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we give the example in the book of one of our first big arguments was uh, <laughs> about this kitchen towel. And it can be <laughs> as simple as that. Her version of neat, my version of neat. Yeah. These are both unconscious agreements that we've made based on the people who we were raised by mm -hmm. and the circumstances we were raised in. Yeah. And so bringing that which is unconscious to the consciousness, to, to an awareness, is a game changer because you can't intervene in a world you can't see. Yeah, and the, and the cool thing about conscious agreements and that the whole tool that it is, is if you're in any relationship with any person, whether it's a romantic, family, or business, you're going to have disagreements. And disagreements are just what Preston said, my version of one thing, mm -hmm. your version of the other thing. And the, the thing is, is most people fight because they're fighting thinking that their agreement is the right way. It's the way that things should be. And what we're um, offering to people is a new way to look at it, to say, okay, I get that this is your version mm -hmm. and here's my version. Neither one is right or wrong because I get that it's right to you and you get that it's right to me. But what feels good for the both of us? What feels most effective for the both of us as a team? Yeah. Let's create a conscious agreement together. So that would be the choice. You're choosing to make a conscious agreement and you're choosing that whatever this is, it certainly isn't worth violating agreement number one. So you're making that second choice that we don't even want to go there. Yeah, it, well, exactly. It's, it's really about going, we have a choice on how we want to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Do we want to fight to be right and you know, live in dissonance with each other and live in this like terrible feeling? Or do we want to create a compassionate way to be with one another and really support the relationship? Yeah. And the thing is, and, and I'm going to speak to our relationship. Yeah. We are conscious workout partners that get to have sex. And <laughs> the awesome part about that is all of the places that get reflected mm -hmm. in this dance that we're in, right? And so, you know, going back to con unconscious agreements, there have been things that have been unconscious agreements that I've been operating from that have caused, uh, let's say, a, a disagreement, caused some type of argument that was brought to consciousness. And then I fought for it with my ego for a while and then realized that those were just wounds mm -hmm. and that I, I did not want to choose that agreement anymore, that I actually could come, quote unquote, to the side that Alexi was standing from. And so back to it, none of this thing makes it like being in life on autopilot sucks, yeah. even when you think it doesn't. And so for me, this is where all the freedom lies. This is why we put it as number one, because when you can catch what's been running you, you can then choose what you would like to experience in this lifetime. Which, pr which brings up a, a huge word that you're really, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head here, awareness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And awareness is really the key because, you know, Preston and I say you cannot intervene in a world that you cannot see. And we truly believe that when you can see yourself from an objective perspective and you can see what's operating you, you then have the awareness to choose something else. But without that awareness, there is no choice. So we offer in the book, especially in step number one, so many different tools and so many different strategies to really build your awareness muscle and, and discover new parts and new ways of seeing yourself that you may have never seen yourself in before. And once you have that objective kind of view, that you know bird's eye view of how you're showing up, you can then direct the you that you are into a whole new reality. It makes sense. Can you tell us what are diminishers? Ew. You want to talk on this? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, in essence, diminishers are those little, uh, let's say, they, diminishers work for our ego. Mm -hmm. And what happens is we all have a dominant diminisher. We, we have many of them, but there's always one that shows up right when you're about to break through um, or when anything is happening. So one of my dominant diminishers, and we're going to go through a few of them, is, is I got this, right? So even if I don't know, I'll mm -hmm. just jump in and be like, oh, I got this. And that diminisher is the thing that is actually holding me and keeping me from living my greatness. Another one would be procrastination. How many of you guys have ever had that where, you, where <laughs> you're like, okay, 
I know exactly what I have to do. Yes, I know what I have to do, but I'm going to scroll through Facebook and Instagram for three hours first. And watch videos on gorillas. And then I'm going to call my mom and make sure that she distracts me for a little while longer until I can put this off till tomorrow. Yeah, or if you're like me, one of your diminishers could be perfectionism, where you're waiting for everything to be perfect, and you're waiting for all the ducks to be in a row before you launch, before you say yes, before you put yourself out there, because your ego knows that nothing will ever be perfect. So your ego goes, well, if she lives from perfectionism, she'll never have to put herself out there enough to get hurt. And that's truly what the ego is looking to do. It's going, how can I hold this person back Mm -hmm. so that they don't fully invest and get hurt? The ego is working for our um, self-approval. Our, the ego is working for looking good, but it's not working for an extraordinary life because an extraordinary life takes risk and it takes really putting yourself out there. So the reason we put diminishers in the book is because once you know your boss diminisher, Mm -hmm. you start to see it show up over and over and over again. And instead of letting yourself kind of fold to the diminisher and take direction from that guy, you go, ah, okay, I see you. And I'm on the cusp of something like, this means I'm I'm right at the brink of something really good. So let me keep pushing through. And it's actually, it becomes almost like an expectation of, ooh, okay, I'm doing the work, I'm in the game, mm-hmm. and now I get to take the next step. Yeah, which is one of the things we added in there uh, in a conversation mm-hmm. we're constantly in is about overriding the system. So uh, the other day I was, we were doing a Skype, and, and then I wanted to shut down uh, Skype, but it wouldn't shut down. And so... You know, I put force quit like a hundred times, still nothing would happen. (laughs) But when I held the power button Mm -hmm. for, you know, 30 seconds, it overrode what was happening. And so for us, this is, this is an analogy or metaphor, whatever you want to call it for life. You know, once you can see which diminisher is showing up, then you get to override the system and go, oh, okay, this is, this is my version of sabotage. This is, you know, the know-it-all showing up. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, uh, perfectionism showing up. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to override my conditioned tendency to do this because we're just patterns and habits, you know, in, in a body. And we can change those patterns and habits to support us or we can keep them in a particular way and they can – life can suck. <laughs> I was going to say very cool, but very cool that life can suck, but very cool the awareness there. And, and actually, it kind of segues to step number two perfectly, be radically responsible, because you're talking about be radically responsible to witness your diminishers and then to hit that override button and yeah. to go for it anyway. So what exactly is radical responsibility? Yeah, radical responsibility is it, it, it's taking 100% responsibility for your role in creating, allowing, or perpetuating an event to Mm -hmm. occur. So a lot of people who have done transformation work or personal development, they've heard of the concept of responsibility, but they've actually kind of taken it out of context and they've turned it into Mm self-blame. Like, oh, I'm to blame for this happening. I'm to blame for that. Flipped it right on its head. Yeah, exactly. And and for us, we really want to be clear that radical responsibility is not about blame because blame still denotes that there's a should involved. There's a way that this should have gone. There's a right and a wrong. And we don't like to play in that black and white thinking. We like to play in the gray because life is gray. You know, life is very gray. And for us, we think that radical responsibility is about going, okay, if two people are involved in this scenario and Mm -hmm. something happens, it's not 50-50. It's 100%. If this person over here takes 0% responsibility for it, how am I 100% responsible for my part? They're, they're on their own with how they're responsible for theirs. But creating it, how did I create this scenario? How did I set myself up for this? You know, And some people will look at that and go, oh, I don't know. You know. My husband cheated on me. How did I create that? And we say, you know, we have this example in the book, So many times that happens where one partner will cheat. And of course, it's so easy to look at the other person and go, they're in the wrong. They did wrong. I'm right. But often we take our clients and we say, okay, where have you been cheating in your relationship? Have you been cheating with your child? Have you been cheating with your work? Have you been cheating with your affection and like withholding that? And so that we often don't want to look at how we're responsible for creating the perfect environment for something to grow out of. 
And then there is um, allowing, which allowing is is a tricky one to really take responsibility for because Mm -hmm. you really have to be willing to look at yourself and go, oh, I've been seeing those red flags for the last two years and I haven't done anything about it. Oh, I've been seeing all the signals, but I've been avoiding it because I didn't want to be lonely, you know? And then there's perpetuating where for me, um, and I talk about this in the book, I had a really hardcore scenario happen to me when I was 20 where I was sexually assaulted and raped. And while I didn't create that, while I didn't allow that, Mm -hmm. I perpetuated that because I carried that with me. I carried that trauma with me for six years before I ever faced off with it. And then I had to do the deep work of forgiving and compassion and all of that. But from 20 to 26, I was perpetuating the story. I was perpetuating this victim consciousness of, I'm a victim, I can't trust anyone, I can't move forward, I, you know, I need to be protective and I need to like shield my heart and can't show who I truly am. Mm-hmm. And that was me perpetuating the event. So those are the three ways that we can be radically responsible for stuff. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also leave your comments, have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're gonna get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>